Oh, yay. Now I know it's on. Okay. So let me let, there's a couple people waiting. So let me admit them. Hello, everyone. We're recording this program. So if you'd like to change your name or if you'd rather not be on screen, that's fine. You can change your name by going to participants and there there's an option. You might wanna just use your initials or just your first name. That's entirely up to you. We're going to start at 6.30. It's so good to have you with us today. And I feel like I just said good morning. Did I say good morning? I hope not. <laughs> It's usually when I start my day at the library. Oh, well. <laughs> Hi, Susan. I'm looking forward to the presentation, too. With, were you with us? for the virtual cocktail presentation. That was another good program. Unfortunately, that one we did not get recorded, but this one will be, and it will be posted for 30 days on our YouTube page for Aurora Public Library District. Oh, I'm sorry you missed the virtual cocktail. Amy presents at many different libraries. Amy, are you going to have your schedule of presentations on your webpage? I do. I have two more holiday ones next week and then one in January on the 70s food. Uh, but then I'm taking a little break. I probably will send out a newsletter in another week uh, about what's coming up. <laughs> oh, terrific. And they can sign up for the newsletter through your website, right? Yeah. Okay, great. So if anybody's interested, and Amy will give us all that information. Email down here too. Great. We got about two more minutes and we have other people joining us and then we'll begin, officially begin. Great, so Amy's email is in the chat. If you need to reach out to her with any questions or comments. I thought I should have my coffee and Christmas cookies with me while I listen to this. I know it's going to make me crave some. <laughs> I don't think I'll bake them, but I would certainly purchase them. <laughs> and we will have the recipes out to all of you tomorrow. I apologize for the delay in that. That's my fault. I, I thought I'd sent them to you. That, mixing uh, up my programs, I think. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. It's just, I, we're a little short staffed at work and things change. So, but we'll get them out tomorrow in plenty of time. And if anybody really wants to bake tonight, you know, just, just let me know in the comments and I'll make sure I get that to you tonight, but otherwise tomorrow. <laughs> okay. Okay. We're going to go ahead and get started and I will continue to watch and see if we have more people joining us. So this is being recorded. Again, if you prefer not to have your camera on, that's fine. It's up to you, whatever you're comfortable with. If you'd like to change your name, just put your initials or your first name. That's also an option. Um, I am working off of a Chromebook, so it shows on mine participants on the very bottom. And that's where I
Jackie Alessio is an award-winning librarian with a black belt in karate. She is also an author, a very good one. Her fiction works include the Amazon best-selling Alana and O'Neill Mysteries, that's with also with vintage recipes. And she does write romance, and that's under a pseudonym, right? Yes, okay. And you can tell us more about these things, Amy. She's an adjunct professor for Dominican University. She's given over 300 presentations to libraries and large groups on vintage cooking and crafts. And there is just so much more to Amy. But I'm going to turn it over to her now. If you have any questions during the program, please hold them till the end or write them in the chat. And thanks so much for coming this evening. Karen, thanks so much for that wonderful introduction. I'm so happy to be giving a talk with the Aurora Library again. I do want to mention that you faded for a minute there. So if I ever fade, try to let me know. And I have my 13 year old is nearby and I have a spare cord. <laughs> if there's any kind of internet issue and that has happened shows, but we'll, we'll keep, keep on. And thank you all for coming tonight. I recognize some of you from some of my other shows um, and it's nice to see you again. Um, tonight we're going to talk about vintage holiday cookies and candies and I sure hope everybody ate dinner because you're about to get very hungry. So from foodtimeline.org it says Christmas cookies as we know them today trace their roots to these medieval European recipes. Dutch and German settlers introduced cookie cutters, decorative molds, and festive holiday decorations to America. Uh, gingerbread was probably the first cookie associated with Christmas and sugar cookie type recipes descended from English traditions. Animal crackers began as edible ornaments. And so that's kind of interesting. I don't know how many of you have animal crackers on your tree. Uh, probably not too many. All right. So what I want to do is talk about my vintage cookbook collection and some of the recipes they recommend for the holidays. Um, I had, until we started remodeling a month ago, I had 2,000 vintage cookbooks, including uh, pamphlet cookbooks. I probably got rid of about a third of them, um, but I kept uh, most of my favorites. And I have been giving these talks for 12 years now. And uh, I had a blog for 13 years on my favorite vintage cookbook recipes. But how I got into this um, was that neither of my grandmothers wrote anything down with their recipes. And so I would read cookbooks like novels. I'm more adventurous than I am successful with cooking. And I would uh, read the cookbooks to get memories from them. So this is my grandma Curtin who came from Ireland. Uh, she could do anything. She sewed, she baked, she worked at the Brock's factory from three to 11 uh, in the evening. She say she needed the money for her husband and her three daughters. Uh, her husband worked too. They just, you know, it was right around the depression time. They needed money. So she worked there. Um, but the handful of recipes she left us, there were about seven and two were for kolachkis, which I love. She had her priorities in order. Uh, there was also one for beef brisket for 50 and another one for an extremely strong Irish coffee. Which I am always amused by that. So if you're a kolachki fan like I am, there is no bad way to make them. I've given this talk so many times and I've given talks on kolachki. People are always like, oh, my grandma made them with cream cheese or my grandma made them with melted ice cream or, you know, it depends on ethnicities, how they're made too. And it's so much fun to see all the different traditions. Uh, and you'd be surprised at all the different backgrounds and traditions that make a variation of kolachkis. And when you get your packet, you're going to get uh, my favorite one is a thumbprint style one that I make in mini muffin pans. And those are just amazing. So her favorite was the kolachkis, which I've got pictured here. This is my grandma, Alessio. Um, I kept my name when I got married. She uh, also wrote nothing down. And she is the one who taught me that bad food is still good memories. If you're new to my show, this is a new uh, slide to hear. If you've been to my shows, you've probably heard this one a number of times. But she turned 89 about seven times. Uh, her birthday was on Christmas. She just didn't want to turn 90 every year. She was 89 again. So that's fine. She wasn't hurting anybody, um, but she was still trying to make her Italian gravy in her apartment uh, and she couldn't see it all. So it was not good uh, in that form, but I always say I would give anything to have it in that form again. I mean, we just got such a kick out of her still trying to make her gravy for my 
uh, siblings and I and our spouses. Uh, so that was a, a fun memory. Um, she made Pizzelles at this time of year. And Pizzelles are one of the few things that always turn out right for me. I bought a Pizzelle maker a few years ago and I'm just amazed that it cranks out like a hundred, the recipe that it came with. And they always turn out really well and they're delicious. Um, when Pizzelles are warm from the Pizzelle maker, you can also fold them and turn them into uh, cannolis or you know cookie tacos, whatever way you'd like to do that. Uh, um, but they are delicious. So is there a tradition in your family that people like to make at this time of year? This is a reference book called Betty Crocker's Cookie Book. It's got about 12 different printings through the decades. And what I like about this one is it's kind of a reference book about cookies in different uh, eras. And it'll tell you what was popular when. Um, just look at that cover. You can see, I bet, several that you have enjoyed in the past. I like those chocolate cracked ones. Um, I see versions with the cookie press, uh, a lot of fun little ones there. And the pictures they have on the right are a lot of classic holiday cookies, including kolachkis in the lower right. They are thumbprint cookies version of them uh, that are rolled in nuts first and then pressed in the mini muffin pan and baked. And then they have candied pineapple in them. And you see cookie press cookies here. There's a version of Madeline's. Um, a lot of the candy cane twists will be in your uh, packet of recipes. Um, so a lot of fun ones. And they say that the trend now is exchanges. I'll tell you what they said for past decades, but I don't think the trend now is for exchanges. They need to update post COVID. Recipes, I think is how we do this uh, safely. So it said from the 1920s to the 1930s, brownies were popular. Well, that's when they kind of got their start, uh, brownies. From the 30s to the 40s, it was molasses crinkles, which makes a lot of sense because they would have been rationing sugar uh, during the 40s, during wartime. So chocolate chip cookies were popular. That's when they also were invented. 40s to the 50s, caramel refrigerator cookies. As people got busy with entertainings post-wartime and they had like refrigerator cookies they could pull out, slice up and bake. Holiday fruit drops, which I honestly don't think was popular at any time. Somebody didn't do their research on that one. Uh, 50s to the 60s, slated peanut crisps, bonbon cookies. Well, think again, cocktail parties and entertaining. And it said today there's exchanges. And as I mentioned, but exchanges at the holiday have been around. I mean, you hear my grandma Kurt used to make fruitcake for all the neighbors. Um, people would make strudel that would be an all day process. Um, there has always been some form of sharing. Uh, but now, of course, things are a little bit different. Some of the favorite ones in my collection are the Power Company holiday cookie booklets. Uh, it seems like several power companies in the Midwest force their employees to come up with their best holiday cookies, and they're always good. It's like a church or a community cookbook. Uh, and these actually go for some money on eBay. If you find Illinois Power or uh, Western Electric has some, and the Wisconsin Electric I really like. Um, and this one is so charming. Uh, I love how they use dolls. Uh, to for their pictures and look at on the right they're totally out of scale we've got like mrs beasley and then teacher barbie and they don't fit at all um, but this such charming these pictures such charming little scenes uh, and the recipes in here are so good including the only chocolate spritz i have ever seen for the cookie press that isn't too dry um, so that one will also be in your packet so if you have some of these in your background or if you like to collect community cookbooks Try to find one of these on eBay, the Midwest Electric Company cookbook. You'd be amazed at the things that are in there. And here we have from Good Housekeeping's Book of Cookies, 1958. There's all kinds of advice on packing and chipping cookies. And some of these are fun and some of these are wildly unrealistic. Um, are how many of you are going to be sewing and making your own gingerbread house and dough and putting the cookies in there? I'm pretty sure we'd all love to receive that, right? <laughs> Especially if somebody made it, that'd be like a treasure. But I don't think any of us are going to be doing it. Um, so it's, it's kind of a fun way that they think a child would do that. I like the one next to it, the cookie sheet that you would give a neighbor or a friend uh, and you would put cookies on it and wrap that up and give it as a gift. That's a great gift for somebody with a new apartment. Uh, that is a not too expensive holiday gift you could give someone or a work exchange or something. That is a good idea. I'm not sure people are exchanging food things or even all going to work <laughs> if they're not in a library, right, Karen? But uh, yes, it, it is a fun idea for the future. The one two over from there, I just love. And that's one I've done a lot. Write the recipe on the wrapping paper. Uh, that is a fun way to recycle. 
It's a nice treasure. It's very hard to get handwritten recipes from people right now. And everybody loves to collect them and they like to have that old handwriting, but nobody likes to do that. And I have lots of uh, collections of, of boxes of recipes where people type them perfectly. When's the last time you've even seen a typewriter? I suspect you can get a used one at the library if you absolutely had to for a small project or something. I don't even know though. Some libraries have them, but uh, imagine typing out a recipe perfectly. And what do you do if you make mistakes and stuff? I mean, it's just, it's very different. Um, so a lot of advice on the bottom on packing and shipping the cookies. And, and these old cookbooks have advice on shipping them to soldiers too. Definitely a sign of the times, um, but some fun ideas here that still can be translated to today. Uh, some of these I just don't understand. Uh, the ones that are rolled, that's probably a good way to pack things. Uh, the one wrapped up hobo style is certainly nothing we'd want to see in a modern cookbook. That, you know, no. <laughs> All right. So the tradition of making cookies from Better Homes and Gardens, Homemade Cookies, 1975. Let the whole family join in the fun of Christmas preparations. Have each individual personalized giant size Christmas card cookies with messages for holiday greetings. And these certainly would work for dreidels or other shapes and other uh, celebrations at the holidays. There's a couple of things wrong with this picture. One is we don't see the whole family working on this, do we? We just see the ladies uh, working at this. And maybe, you know, the picture doesn't cover the whole avocado green experience for us there because you can tell this is 1975. I just got a kick out of the idea of making a giant cookie for someone and having that be the holiday greeting card. That's a great idea. Which of us would not like to receive a big cookie? Right? It doesn't always have to be a platter with a hundred different cookies. A big one is kind of cute too. And I love the way they're having the kid decorate them. They don't have to look perfect to be something people enjoy. Case in points. So this is from Complete Wilton Book of Candy, 1981. The old version of making marzipan holiday treats is on the left. Uh, imagine the work involved in making Mrs. Claus and her donuts there or Santa's beard. Now you might see these things made out of Fimo clay where they'd be, you know, you would keep them and you would bring them out year after year. I used to do Fimo clay with the teen programs so that I was at the Schomburg Library uh, and they could make amazing things and, and just like a toaster oven. But these were made and they're edible. Um, you don't see too many people making those kind of things now. Ones on the right are more the style of today the faster and easier, but still fun to do as a family or, you know, by yourself. I don't know that I could pull off that tree. Honestly, that one's awfully cute. I could see mine coming out more like a bush, um, but it is uh, delicious and fun and not too hard to do. If you can do popcorn balls, you can put that together, but certainly the snowman is something we could probably all pull off. One of my favorite things is this picture. Look at those bars in the front. So Wilton referred to those as health food bars. They're covered in fondant. It's like uh, there might be something healthy in there, but it is well covered with other things. All right. So fudge and Christmas candy, a holiday tradition. There is the old way of making fudge. And actually my grandma Curtin used to make it that way with the candy thermometer. Um, you stand over it, you stir for half an hour. Um, I think many... There we go. I'm not sure what... Uh... <laughs> right it's okay uh it wouldn't be a zoom program if there wasn't some fun excitement uh in the whole thing uh so i used to say i wouldn't know what to do with a program that went 100 percent. although karen's usually are pretty close uh, after all those years of doing teen programs i none of them went the way they were supposed to go and usually the teens like those better so all right so fudge so my grandma would use the candy thermometer i tried making it that way once and if you've been to my programs you know the story that i melted down the candy thermometer by accident i stepped away to do laundry you can't do that if you're making fudge the old way so uh, and there's a reason it's so expensive at door county or long grove or wherever you see it uh the dells because it's very it's complicated but then in the 50s they found a faster easier way to make it but first let me mention that on the right is the 1949 culinary arts institute 250 ways to make candy uh is an art form uh in those days and look at those delicious treats uh even the coconut nest things are decorated for the holidays down there and they have some marzipan fruits um, they also have an entire section on how to make divinity fudge, which is a particular soft, fluffy flavor of it. They also have four or five other versions. 
excuse me, and ways to make your own pralines and fondant. I'm not sure how many of us are skilled at those kind of things now. It is definitely an art form. So in the 50s, you start to see a lot of recipes in the community cookbooks for fabulous fudge. Um, I'm pretty sure every community cookbook I have has fabulous fudge in it, which either has condensed milk or marshmallow cream, and this one has both. Uh, and I typed out what they wrote. Uh, look at the lovely handwriting on that one. Um, so fudge has been around. Uh, one of the first documentations of it was by a student at Vassar College. And she wrote, and this was in 1888, that a friends had made it uh, a couple of years previous and sold it for 40 cents a pound. So she made the recipe. And this is one of the first documented ones. Made 30 pounds of it for the Vassar Senior Auction. Imagine 40 cents a pound. Uh, I think at the Dells, we were up at the Dells for Thanksgiving and I'm pretty sure it was like $12 for like a small, like a two inch square uh, of fudge. So very different. Um, and so the original fudge recipes were very delicate and precise and you had to measure the temperature. All of a sudden in the fifties, people realized they can use marshmallow cream. And it's a whole new ball game. Now, are, is one better than the other? Some are more delicate or whatever, but this is still fudge and it's fun to eat. It's a lot easier to make. All right, so traditional food for the holidays is candy canes. I couldn't resist putting that robe in there, even though I know it's fuzzy. The robe and the slippers. Imagine the holidays without the, um, the look of candy canes or just, they're everywhere, right? And I even see unusual flavors of them now, like bacon candy canes. Uh, I saw... I see strange ones every time I go to the store, new and unusual flavors of them, but a lot of people like the original red and white. Um, so originally though, they were published in the mid 17th century as a white stick of sugar. And they had to be made by confectioners who had to pull, cut, twist, and bend the sticks by hand. They didn't start bending them until later. And the story is uh, from ChristmasSantaShop.com that the hook shape was credited to a choir master at a cathedral in Germany, who in 87, ah, 1670, bent straight candy sticks into canes to represent a shepherd's crook. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. They didn't start making them automatically uh, until the 20s when they started mass producing them. That's the word I made. And the candy, oh, actually the candy cane machine was invented in the 50s. Um, so they started figuring out how to do them faster. Imagine that. And they sure weren't making them with bacon or whatever in those days. Uh, so the candy cane, it was a very elaborate process, but not as elaborate as this one. So about uh, 10 years ago, I was invited downtown to the Culinary Art uh, Institute to, quote, help them figure out what to do with some weird donations. I was like, how did you know <laughs> how to, who to reach? for that. Uh, and so plenty of weird donations. And I did help them sort out which ones they wanted for their library. And they offered to let me have a meal there, which was absolutely amazing from the students, one of the best meals I've ever had. And on the way out, they had an exhibit of weird food and kitchen utensils that no one could identify. I'm like, oh, that's a ribbon crimper. That's to make ribbon candy. And they were amazed that I knew that. Uh, look at that machine, though. Uh, nothing easy to use about that one. There's a reason ribbon candy is hard to find. So a man named F.B. Washburn founded his company in 1856, and he was the oldest candy maker in the U.S., and he gets credit for creating a lot of hard candies, including ribbon candy. Um, and imagine if they were making candy canes by stretching and pulling, imagine how they had to do this. Um, and so from Kendall College, I took a picture of the one in their case. This is the 1886 Champion Candy Crimper. I looked up what it was. Uh, imagine that. While it's hot, it has to be run through that thing. Imagine if it got stuck or you had to clean that thing. And uh, that is not an easy way to make candy. And it's just amazing to me that somebody came up with this machine to like, you know what, that'd be so much fun to make candy in this ribbon form. For a while there, Brock's had little ribbon candies that you could find and eat. Um, and they are harder to find now, even mail order. Uh, so hopefully maybe in future years, we'll be able to find those again. But they're a lovely little treat, uh, an elegant way to eat that. Unlike these, which are still a lot of fun. Uh, these are the Brax peppermint nougats. I still see them at Walgreens. They're usually one of the last things there after all the other candy has been bought. 
Um, and if you have any issues with your teeth, you definitely don't want to eat these. Uh, very chewy. Um, so Brock, and I always like to talk about Brock's because my grandma worked there, of course. So, so 1904, Emil Brock opened his Palace of Sweets at North Avenue and Town Street in Chicago. The Think about that. So we're in World War I era. That is a lot of candy. Um, and so eventually they grew bigger and bigger plants until they moved out of Chicago. Um, and of course, their plant was used in a Batman movie where it was blown up. So we have <laughs> a lot of interesting uh, history with the Brock's company, but they're still uh, making these. For a while there, they were trying variations of these that were so nasty. I don't know if any of you ate them. There was a winter green one that was just it was like eating breath mint gum. It was just not good. Yeah, no. But I would rather eat that than these. I think this is sugar plums or what my vintage cookbooks think of sugar plums. And I've talked about this before is sometimes the vintage cookbooks are trying to fill space or come up with some traditions that they think people are going to be interested. And this is from McCall's book of Mary Eating in the 60s. Um, they said this is a version of sugar plums. It absolutely isn't. Sugar plums are candied nuts. That is the thing people are dreaming of in the uh, in the rhyme. Uh, they are not dreaming of pears in dubious green sauce, right? Nobody wants this. And look at that cocktail. Wow. <laughs> um, I don't know, uh, maybe wine with fruit in it, or maybe it's some kind of sangria. I could see possibilities for this. It just isn't that appealing. I mean, sugar plums are better. When I first started doing these talks, of course, I would bring the treats to all the libraries. I did that up uh, up until last year. And then, so the first year I did it, Jelly Belly had a version of sugar plums. And I thought, oh, great, I'm going to serve these. So they were just like big Jelly Bellies. They were huge discs that probably people just used to decorate uh, gingerbread houses is what I think they were for. Uh, they were not good. They were not tasty and they smelled so strong. It like overpowered the room. I had like four or five little treats on a plate like gingerbread. All you could smell was this like plum uh, and it was not uh, tasty at all. People are like, is this a sugar plum? I'm like, no, nope. <laughs> absolutely not. But what about gumdrops? So gumdrops have been invented by a gentleman named Percy Truesdale in 1801. Uh, there is a holiday for a national gumdrop day on February 15th. Now think about that. You eat chocolate for Valentine's Day, or at least I do, uh, and, or maybe you give chocolate. And then February 15th is gumdrop day. I think that's a marketing thing to swing people then into the spring candy season. But you know, gumdrops have their place. I love the cute little wreath I found on Pinterest that somebody made that looks like a lot of work, but it's really cute and it's appealing and they make fun decorations. There's a whole genre genre in the vintage cookbooks of gumdrop art. Uh, it's crazy. I have a Halloween cookie one where you're supposed to cut black gumdrops into seven unequal pieces. There's a diagram and form it into a cat. I've never in one, it's just, you need an exacto to make this thing happen. Um, but on the right is cherry candle cake from Better Homes and Gardens Holiday Cookbook 1959. It's supposed to be a time-saving cake for the holidays. You're supposed to purchase an angel food cake um, and then slice it uh, horizontally and put a mixture in the middle, which is lime jello with uh, drained pineapple, which actually is quite good. I use that mixture on, on top of cakes for St. Patrick's Day. You, you can put it on a nine by 13. Um, but then it says, take a rolling pin and roll gumdrops and tie them in a bow. I can't even imagine. Wouldn't it continuously stick? There's nothing time-saving about that process. If you wanted some cute bows on your cake, you can get like a Twizzlers or something like some red things. But this, I don't know. And I, it comes up a lot that they want you to roll out gumdrops and do things with them. I, I'd love to know how that tradition started. Here's from Betty Crocker's Good and Easy Cookbook, 1954. Holiday open house days are happy days, times you share with family, neighbors, and friends. An open house is one of the easiest and most pleasant ways to have guests drop in. I do love that description. What are some unpleasant ways to have guests drop in? Maybe an unplanned thing is what they mean. But this looks like a lot of work to me, but they're awfully cute. Look at the decorated sugar cookies in the lower right corner, and that moon is particularly pretty. And then, of course, we have fruitcake. 
And to my amusement, there are kicks trees uh, stuck into apples in the middle of the page. I bet they're tasty. Um, it's just like Rice Krispie treats made with kicks. Um, it says you make the kicks with uh, a quarter cup of butter, a half pound of marshmallows, five cups of kicks, uh, and then colored sugar. And then you uh, form them into trees and then stick them in the apple. It certainly looks pretty all together. And I see they've made good use of gumdrops as decorations in this one, but certainly a lot of fun things. This would be a nice open house to attend uh, maybe in a few years. There are some easier ways to make candies if you're not a fudge person. The ones in the lower right are what we would all recognize as turtles. They came in second in a Pillsbury Bake Off. Uh, I, yeah, I can never remember what came in first that year. There's another one like that, the peanut butter blossom cookies that a lot of people like at the holidays. Is peanut butters with a Hershey's kiss in the middle. Those also came in second in a Pillsbury Bake Off. Um, and usually the things that came in first, there's other instances of that too, were like trendy things for that time. Like I think uh, for the uh, peanut blossoms, the thing that came in first was like lemon walnut bars or something that would have been like the fancy food network version. And then there's the favorite. So you can't call them turtles. It was trademarked, um, but every cookbook has a version of them. Now, I've recently seen a microwave version made with uh, square pretzels, you know, those ones that look like little grids, and Rolos in the microwave, and then you can add nuts to them. So there are easy ways to do it. Um, if you like making candy, or you can do it with other family members. The pastel mints are made with cream cheese and tons of confectioner's sugar, like two bags. Uh, you can find recipes for those. Even Martha Stewart has done a version of it. Um, Oh, great. Somebody's offering advice on how to uh, manage with the gumdrops. I'm going to read that at the end. That does seem like fun. I don't know that I'd still want to. All right. So if you like making candy, there are some easier ways to do it. And this was a photo from the Better Homes and Gardens 1966 Cookies and Candy. Okay. But what about fondant? Well, fondant was a little different. Think how today the Food Network fondant cakes are those elaborate scenarios. You see like Disney cakes or Halloween cakes. So fondant really started out more as like, um, it was used for decorations, but it, they also made cookies and things out of fondant by itself. This is the Illinois Power Cookbook. And it says electrical gifts spell more value for everyone, uh, which I think is funny. That must, I. How hard did they work on that slogan for the holidays? You know, what else could they have said about electrical gifts? But they have these awesome cookies, so that can be forgiven. It says use fondant frosting. So instead of just lining your cakes with it, use it to make cookies out of them because they're easy to pack and add chocolate chips to it. So the fondant maybe was a little bit different or stiffer. Um, and so the bottom right ones are a type of fondant cookie. It's just like a form of the fondant with chocolate chips. It's kind of a cross between the fondant we'd recognize now and fudge, I think. Um, but I thought those pictures were kind of fun. Here's coconut twigs. These will be in your packet. It says bedazzle mom and pop on Christmas day with coconut coffee fudge, date nut delights and coconut twigs. Um, so I enjoyed the mugs in the little wreaths, how they have decorated over there, but these are super easy. It says you melt chocolate in a double boiler and add coconut. Um, you can do it in the microwave with the meltable uh, bark that you can find at the store in either milk chocolate or white chocolate. Um, and these were from another uh, 250 ways to make candy, which is an update of the 40, 1949 one I discussed, but still has a lot of fun treats on there. So the coconut twig. You can tint them different colors. Um, I tend to like some of those microwave treats if you need things in a hurry. Look at these elegant treats from 1949 from the Miro cookbook. Many good cooks take great pride in their cookie recipe collections and enjoy keeping the cookie jar well filled with a variety of their favorites. Um, so these were made with the cookie press. All right, in theory, look at the lovely elegant decorations. Now here's mine. <laughs> Not as much patience, not quite as elegant, right? So I have two cookie presses. Uh, one is a copy of the one my mom had in the lower left. Uh, she gave my ours to my sister. My niece uses it. So my sister and I used to make uh, cookies with the press every winter, and we made blue snowmen for whatever reason. I thought everybody did, and so I started giving these talks and realized that nobody else made snowmen. That's probably good 
the snowman die is awfully cute, but it burns so easily. Those arms will burn right off. Uh, or maybe that was the way we made it. So you can tell I don't do very fussy things with the spritz. In fact, you can tell I rolled one in a ball there. I must have gotten tired. Um, but I do like using the can cookie presses. And you can find old ones and they still work. The Miro one is nice and fat, which just makes it easy to clean and load. Um, the one on the left is fun. Uh, my grandma Alessio used to always make the um, like the jagged edge one that you see there into strips and she'd make it into ribbons and she, that was her thing and that was the only way she made it. Um, people tend to have a favorite dye. When I used to talk about this on my blog, someone told me she loved this. She met the one that looks like a Y. You can see it there on the table. It turns out as a heart. Um, but she said she and her family referred to that as a Star Trek die. That's no weirder than Blue Snowman. You know, everybody's got their traditions. From Sugar Spoon Recipes, Domino Sugar Cookbook, 1962. Uh, here's a version of the spritz that I used in the cookie press. Domino Sugar uh, Cookbook was one that was donated to the Schomburg Library that I worked there. Every unusual cookbook donation would end up on my desk. At one point, I had four copies of a particular Elvis cookbook. <laughs> and there was no point putting them back in the donations. Then some other librarian would put that back on my desk. So, But the Domino Sugar one, I particularly liked. I just love the drawings. And there's all kinds of handwritten things in there, advice. You'll see it in a minute with my snowballs. So maybe you have a favorite version you do for the cookie press. I don't always use almond extract. Uh, sometimes I just use vanilla. Sometimes I'd use mint extract for some of mine, especially if I'm doing something green. I don't know what we used to do with the blue. I think we did them in vanilla or mint. I don't, you know, blue doesn't lend itself exactly to a particular extract. We have different ideas for gingerbread for the holidays. And as I mentioned in the first slide, it's been around since the 1700s. The UK takes credit for starting it and for starting making the cookies. Uh, out of it. So in the vintage cookbooks, I see a lot of elaborate ones uh, all the way back in my cookbook collection. The one in the lower right is actually from the Depression era when people would not have had a lot of extra. Um, and you, that doesn't have the fanciest decorations and it still is perfectly cute with the vanilla wafers. The one on the left is from Farm Journal. And of course they had to make a barnyard scene. Uh, and one of my, the people who went to my shows made one of these once. It was awfully cute, uh, a lot of fun. And I love how they did the fences with the pretzels. But the Betty Cracker cookie book decided you should use gingerbread year round. You can see in the upper right, and they said, use them for baby showers. Uh, you can make them into boy and girl. I thought that was a great idea. So not just limited. And some people go absolutely crazy with the gingerbread. This is from Disney World's Grand Floridian. Um, and they, I took, they took a break from the gingerbread last year. I believe they have it again this year. Um, this one is actually a shop uh, and I've been in it because you know you can't have any square footage at Disney that isn't selling something. So this is their gingerbread shop and it is made with 1,050 pounds of honey, 600 pounds of powdered sugar, 800 pounds of flour, 140 pints of egg whites and 180 pounds of apricot glaze. And they start making these things very close after Halloween. Most of their big resorts have um, some kind of gingerbread item. Um, we used to stay at the Contemporary and there would be like a tree with people, gingerbread people decorated in the costumes of different countries, which was really fun. All right, so gifts from many cultures. As I mentioned, a lot of the cookbooks didn't research, but they do manage to get some fun ethnic holiday treats in there. And I don't know if any of you have made any of these. Um, some of these are delicious. Uh, actually, they're all delicious, but uh, some of these are more elaborate than others. And from uh, you're supposed to make that whole basket for your neighbors. And the tags are actually cookies where it says Merry Christmas and for the Smiths uh, and actually personalized. Remember, we had that slide of people making cards uh, for the holidays. They add that to the basket. But some of my cookbooks have you can tell they didn't really research. Um, my Southern Heritage Southern Living cookbooks are amazing. They have all kinds of ephemera. Um, they, I have a whole chapter in the celebrations volume of Mardi Gras recipes, uh, so many fun things, um, but they don't always get it right. And from Southern Heritage Family Gatherings, they said a down home Christmas Eve supper for uh, German style in Texas 
consists of German sausages, sliced beef jerky, homemade yeast loaves, cooked cheese, Christmas cookies, Lebkuchen, and pepper news. Um, most of those things sound good, but it's like, which of these is not like the other? I don't think they're eating beef jerky for Christmas Eve. Uh, I don't, wherever they're from. Um, we know there was a lot of German settlers in Texas. Um, I just think they thought, all right, well, what do people in Texas eat? We got to throw something in there that's like would have been eaten on the ranch. I don't, that doesn't make any sense, but the rest of it sounded pretty good. And we just finished Hanukkah last night it was the eighth night. Um, and the, of course, the most of the recipes have to be fried because uh, the tradition of oil in the lamp lasted eight days when it should only have lasted one. And so most of the foods are cooked with oil for that day. Um, and so the potato pancakes or the latkes are the big favorite then. Um, on my blog, once I had somebody come do a guest post for Hanukkah, and she mentioned that she made hers and shredded potatoes. And there was a big outcry on that. Apparently, <laughs> it's like the Kolatskis. Everybody has their favorite way of making potato pancakes. Uh, you know, they're all, all good, um, but they have to be fried uh, to go along with this uh, holiday. And you can either shred them yourselves or you can purchase ones that are already processed. Um, I will not get the pronunciation right of the jelly donut. Uh, uh, Sufgani. which I appreciated. Um, so the jelly donuts are very popular and that you will see recipes for that um, and any kind of fried donut or food like that. Uh, and you'll see even in the vintage cookbooks, uh, all kinds of advice on how to make donuts uh, for uh, Hanukkah or that time. And then of course there's the gelt, which originally was money that was handed out. And then in the 1920s, they switched it to uh, using, making it with chocolate. Um, and according to the Smithsonian Magazine, the first mention of gelt is ancient. The roots of gelt or money in Yiddish are in the first Jewish minted coins in 142 BCE, after the Maccabees gained independence from the Syrian king and they were stamped with an image of the menorah. So that tradition has been around forever. And then they switched to candy in the 20s, uh, because they said it was cheaper <laughs> than handing out. But sure, but I bet people like receiving the chocolate too for the dreidel games. Okay. So then we have Kwanzaa. Did I get rid of? Okay, right. There we go. Mine are a little bit out of order, the holidays. We're moving to after Christmas now from the December 26th to New Year's Day is Kwanzaa and celebration invented in this country by a professor in about 1967. Uh, each day is a cultural celebration for African-Americans. Now my boys are African-Americans, so we do try to celebrate Kwanzaa. And one of the things I wanted to do was Benny cakes. Uh, Benny cakes are attributed to the slaves uh, from the South. And what you'll find now is that they're listed in many Southern cookbooks as plantation cookies, which I always find kind of amusing. They're also as served at Southern relative, uh, restaurants but they are little lemon cakes that are quite elegant. This is a picture from my Southern heritage, Southern living. It is Christmas tea and it's supposed to be the day after Thanksgiving. Uh, they have a whole bunch of menus. Imagine putting this tea together the day after you would have prepared all that food for Thanksgiving. That's crazy, including a fruit cake. But when I've made the many cakes in the past, and my boys still like to talk about this, for whatever reason, mine all melted together in the jelly roll pan and I had to break them apart like toffee. Um, it was delicious, but you know, I was like, you know, <laughs> on the table and breaking them apart. They certainly didn't look like that. And I did not make them the day after Thanksgiving. But if you haven't, uh, if you're not as knowledgeable about Kwanzaa, take a look it up because each day Another day is creativity. Another day is uh, self-determination. Each day uh, might have suggested activities. I bet the library is doing some things for Kwanzaa or at least has books on it. So you could look at it. Okay, the Feast of Santa Lucia is December 13th. Uh, it's one of those holidays like St. Patrick's Day that has kind of grown more in this country from the descendants than from the original uh, country where it came from. And the tradition was that the oldest daughter in each family would wear a white dress with a red sash and carry an evergreen wreath with seven candles on her head. 
Uh, today they use battery operated uh, wreaths, uh, crowns, obviously much safer. And the cross buns are the uh, tradition that goes with this one. They had cross buns for breakfast. Also pepper or crocor, which is ginger snaps. Um, and the tradition is you put them on the palm of your hand and you break it with your finger. If they break into three equal parts, you have good luck for the next year. Until they had the good luck for next year and just eating, whichever ones did not break the way they want. St. Nicholas Day, which is today, it's just December 6th. Um, so this is from my Southern Heritage cookie jar. It says speculas are part of the Dutch tradition celebrated December 5th in Holland. Okay, I'm a day off on that one. The night before, children leave carrots in their shoes for the saint's horse, and in the morning, each child finds treats in place of the carrot. At the evening, they have larger gifts at the end of a treasure hunt. Speculas baked in people-shaped molds called bachelors and spinsters are given to single friends. That's, that's kind of strange. And I don't know that that's true. I'm thinking that's from the same people who thought beef jerky was served for Christmas Eve on, uh, in Texas. I don't know that that was always served to uh, single friends only, and that doesn't seem to be very kind. But I bet the cookies were awfully cute. For whatever reason, uh, my family tradition, my dad used to make people-shaped pancakes on Christmas Day. I have no idea why we had this mold or why he did that. And we'd all fight over them because very few of them turned out with the actual head and arms and limbs still attached by the time he would be done uh, frying them. That is another, <laughs> there's a reason I needed to do research into more uh, cookbooks. So getting more interesting traditions. Here's another photo from the uh, 1962 sugar spoon recipes. This one has some writing on it that says, wet the snowballs before rolling, white sugar is best. Snowballs are a descendant of the Mexican wedding cakes, cookies, and that were originally came from this time of year. Everybody has their own version of snowballs. Uh, and it is also kind of a derivative of the crescent shaped cookies also. Um, but this one I thought was kind of fun with the tinted ones, even though the person who owned this before me doesn't like those. Um, you are supposed to tint the confectioner's sugar, and I've never done this, by dropping several drops of food coloring into the center of the sugar in your blender. I, you know, <laughs> it's hard to imagine, and I certainly wouldn't want to do the cleanup on that, uh, but I bet they make delicious treats, and then you roll it in them, and it kind of melts on them. Uh, I bet they're delicious, different ways of doing it. All right, and here's rosettes. I always run into people at these shows that can make these perfectly. That is not something I have been able to do. We use the special iron, you dip it in the batter and then in the oil, and then they supposedly slide off the iron and then you put uh, powdered sugar on them. This tradition comes from a variety of different places. A lot of people think this is French um, and the other sources say it's a Swedish or Norwegian. And uh, there's a version in Finland. There is even a version of these from Mexico. So much fun to see where everybody's family traditions come from. And they even have a version of the cookie press cookies on this slide um, from this particular cookbook uh, where you can see they made the little wreaths out of them. Now local to the, oh, and I don't know why that's blurry, local to this area, Maurice Linnell cookies. And for a while there, you could still get the mail order, not as much anymore, very hard to find. Um, so Maurice Linnell, and I bet some of you have a favorite cookie from these, uh, grew up at a small Swedish bakery in the northwest side of Chicago. In 1937, when he struck out on his own, he used his family recipes to produce cookie jar favorites. Um, some of the most popular favorites ever were the pinwheel swirl and the raspberry jelly swirl. You can see some of the vintage cookbooks that I've talked about had versions of these. Um, and so then he mass produced them. Other ones he had were the wedding cake, uh, nuts filled nougats, anise gingerbread, and many more. I bet some of you remember those. From Betty Crocker's cookie book, this one has a rabid internet following. And the picture on their right is from their modern website. These are the cream wafers. Uh, the traditional way they made them is on the left in the left corner there. Um, they are light, sugary wafers um, with a very light cream in the middle. So not quite as heavy as like a whoopie pie. Um, they are a little bit like that though in style. So you will find the um, website and we'll make a lot of these for Valentine's Day. I see a lot of heart-shaped ones. These are a lot of work. 
Many people love them. Sometimes the Chicago Tribune's cookie winners are derivatives of this one that you'll see people have changed the recipe throughout time. Something a little bit different, of course, is the Linzer cookie. You can actually buy a Pepperidge Farm version of this if you can find it, um, that you don't have to make your own. So these were invented in the same town that is known for Pez candy, which is Linz, Austria, but not from the same source. Uh, so this is, Linz is the home of the Linzer tort, which was a tart made with rich, rich buttery dough accentuated with almonds, lemon zest, and cinnamon. And it used to have a cutout in the top of it to show the filling. And so they made that simpler into a cookie by the time it came to this country around 1856. This one's been around for a while. The first recipe for the Linzer tort was from 1653. Some of these cookies have just been enjoyed for so long. These are a lot of work. <laughs> and I don't know if any of you have tried these. A lovely, elegant little cookies. Pepperidge Farm version is not quite as elegant, but they are tasty. They're very hard to find though. Usually you can only find bags here or there. Um, this was my mom's favorite, was the cathedral windows on the left uh, and the elegant vintage cookie version on the right. I have to say, whenever I bring cathedral windows anywhere, they get snapped up. Super easy. Melted chocolate mixed with marshmallows. You take them off the heat so the marshmallows don't melt. Then you spoon the mixture over wax paper and roll it in a log and put it in the freezer. And then you take it out, uh, roll it, uh, sprinkle powdered sugar over it and slice it. Uh, for functions. Uh, does it look uh, perfectly nice there? And I'm pretty sure that's ones my mom did, not me, because mine don't always come out in the round shape uh, like that. But no, it's so delicious. Just chocolate marshmallows. I mean, what's not to like? On the right are the stained glass. Look at how elegant those are. Those are made with melted Jolly Ranchers. How many of you want to take a bite out of those? You know, I, I don't want the dental bills for biting into that. Um, they look lovely. A lot of people use melted Jolly Ranchers for uh, windows on um, gingerbread houses. Uh, but, you know, which one of these would you rather sink your teeth into? All right. Sometimes the vintage cookbooks uh, get it wrong. And the picture on the left with the scary doll uh, is one of those cases. From 1970, Ladies Home Journal Handbook of Holiday Cuisine. A lot of fancy tips about entertaining. What I was interested in in this picture was not the mincemeat pie, and I've got a vintage picture of mincemeat there, uh, was the Edelweiss cookies. Look at those pretty little cookies. Um, but it is distracting with that doll there. And I always say she was scared because she had some of the recipe on that page, which is called Santa's Nightcap. This is a cup of gin, a cup of light rum, a quarter cup of lime juice, and a quarter cup of maple syrup. Definitely. It, no, you don't want to put that one out for Santa. Um, I can't even imagine. And how did they come up with that recipe? Were they like, okay, we've got a sponsor for maple syrup. We've got to figure out how to throw this in there. Throw it in with a whole bunch of alcohol. No one will even notice the taste. I mean, th it makes no sense. All right. Santa's whiskers are a traditional cookie. I have a lot. I like making these a lot. And I'm not a huge cherry fan, but these are from Better Homes and Gardens cookies. Remember, we're going faster and easier as the decades go by. So these are um, just like regular sugar cookie dough, only they have uh, candied cherries, chopped candied cherries in them. Some of them have nuts. Some of them have coconut in them. You roll, you make them into a roll, you put them in coconut, and then you, you know, chill them. And then you can bake them uh, by slicing them up. And so it says it's supposed to resemble the Jolly Man's beard. Well, that's, you know, not what we want to think of on our cookies, but it's a cute name uh, and it's going to be in your packets. I've made them with the green ones too. Ah, I have two slides of the cream wafers. I wanted to make sure I included those. And this is my family's favorite holiday cookie. I mean, forget all the fun, elegant Linzer cookies and other things I've told you about. This is the one my family loves. Uh, I've gotten away with not doing this one this year because of the kitchen remodeling. The cleanup on this one is not easy either, but it's just like Rice Krispie treats. So it is uh, butter, marshmallows, uh, corn flakes, and then you drop them onto wax paper and then you add the red hot. So I've, I've omitted the red hots and in recent years, I add like M&Ms because everybody picked the Red Hots off. Not, not that many Red Hots fans, I've decided in my family. Um, and mine never looked like these cute little wreaths. Mine were always like big glops on the wax paper. And like the cathedral windows, very popular. A lot of people like to eat these. 
um, again, the cleanup is not that easy. Okay, and one more piece of advice, and then I'll take, uh, I'm gonna look at questions and comments. From Better Homes and Gardens, Homemade Cookies Cookbook 1975. Chewy Noels add a seasonal greeting to the holiday table. Change the message to fit the celebration with colorful decorator icing. It offers a quick and easy way to inscribe festive notes, dates, or names on cookbooks and party desserts. Okay, so if you don't have a traditional holiday thing you want to make, um, I always say use holiday sprinkles. They can fix just about any dessert uh, mishaps, and I won't say how I know that. Or if you have bar cookies, you can uh, put a cute name on it. Imagine people finding their own name on one too, which is kind of fun. Um, and so that is all I have. So what I'm going to do is escape so I can, uh, the slides, not the event, so I can uh, look at your comments and questions. Anybody have a treat I didn't mention? Uh, oops, hang on. That's what I want. There we go. Uh, and I want to hear the gumdrop advice. Here we go. You, is this from you, Karen, about the gumdrops? No? Okay. You smash or roll the gumdrops with powdered sugar to make a kind of clay. It does not stick to your fingers and you can shape it easily. Well, see, that makes sense to me. I roll it out thin and use it to cut into strips or tie into bows. Seems like a lot of work. I love it, though, that you've done this, whoever uh, added that one. Um, I wondered how that happened and you could do it without having it stick to your hands or the rolling. Pin. Thank you. All right, does anybody have a cookie I didn't mention or a favorite one for any of the different holidays? You all thinking about which things you wanna make? <laughs> Are you horrified by my version of the, uh, the awful wreaths with the red hots? Somebody always wants to know how to make those. I don't, you know, those, some of those traditions, I, can, I used to organize cookie exchanges well before COVID and people would go all out making their fanciest kind. And I would make, you know, the cathedral windows and the red hots, uh, the red hot wreaths, but uh, guess which ones got eaten first? You know, the elegant ones uh, had definitely had their place. I love receiving those. Or <laughs> cathedral windows and cornflake uh, sort of wreaths. All right. Anybody have any questions? Oh, the haystacks. Oh God, I love the haystacks. And would you believe I saw them at the Dells for like $9 a piece? If you haven't made the haystacks before, you mix uh, peanut butter chips and uh, melted butterscotch chips, or I've done a version where you melt milk chocolate and, and butterscotch chips just with chow mein noodles. So you can make that in the microwave if you melt your chips. My sister-in-law adores those. Uh, yes, the haystacks have a place and they're sold for a lot of money in Wisconsin. So I'm not sure if they're not aware how easy it is to make those or they just don't want the mess. Thank you for mentioning those, Susan. How about another favorite? Buckeyes. Oh, I love Buckeyes. Again, I have a microwave version. Uh, it is peanut butter and confectioner's sugar um, and butter. And then it's melted chocolate over the top of it. So you melt the first three things in a like casserole dish in your microwave and you let that, uh, you keep adding confectioner sugar until it is pretty solid and then melted chocolate over the top of it. Uh, if you just look up like microwave peanut butter chocolate fudge, um, but a lot of people like the dip ones where you have the solid peanut butter and confectioner sugar and you can dip it in milk chocolate. I don't have as much success with that or patience, which is why I make it in the whole um, casserole pan and then cut it up. But yes, Buckeyes are amazing. Yeah, that's year round. Oh, my grandma would try to get out of making the candy canes. Well, they are kind of a lot of work. You make the two doughs, you dye them one, and then you have to twist them together. Uh, but they're so much fun. You're right. They're delicious. You can flavor them differently. Well, everybody has their favorite things to make. Uh, I'm trying to think of things I hate making. Definitely things like Linzer. I don't like to roll and cut anything. I just don't. <laughs> but my 13 year old loves to. The more complicated, the more he likes it. He makes uh, uh, cooking videos for the Schomburg Library. Uh, and although he did quick, easy dip uh, peanut butter penguins for the holidays because of the kitchen remodeling. We don't even know where the rolling pin is at this point or the, uh, uh, the sheets. 
Uh, you take Nutter Butters and you dip them in melted chocolate. You can use like M&Ms for decoration. You can use candy discs, like the Wilton candy melts for the stomach. I think you used M&Ms for the feet and the eyes and the nose. Very easy to do. Um, so that's one. I should include that one on here because I've seen versions of it. Although obviously not the microwave version. Uh, who knows when we're going to find our pans again. Someone said everything sounds good. Yes, I'm getting very hungry. From <laughs> if I can make the 13-year-old make some of those penguins for me this evening. We now have a sink after the first time in a month. So we can, we can do some of these things again. Oh, I oh, think chocolate chip cookies are great any time of the year. Yes, yes. That, that's like classic chocolate chip cookies any time of the year. And of course, those were invented in the 30s. Those, are, those qualify as a vintage cookbook or a vintage cookie. Somebody says the Nutter Butter Santas. I haven't seen that version. I'll have to look at that. I'll tell the 13-year-old. Yes, you can't go wrong with chocolate chip. And at this time of year, you could use mini red and green M&Ms in those. There's red and green chips. You can always change the things with the decorations if you don't want to make some special holiday thing. Everybody mentioned their favorite. Have you had a chance? Did you see your favorite or mention it? Hopefully. Well, I can tell this is my kind of group. We all like the same things, Karen. <laughs> Well, I think that might be it for everybody's comments or questions. I have my email there. Uh, make small amounts of fondant by kneading a marshmallow and add powdered sugar to make a soft clay. That sounds awesome. How fun. I didn't even know that was possible. I bet this is the same talented person who worked with the gumdrops. You clearly have more patience than I do, but I love that idea. And I bet my 13-year-old would love to try that also. What a fun idea. I want to thank you all for coming tonight. I put my uh, my email in there if you want to sign up for my newsletter. Um, oh, great idea. More ideas coming. These are great. And thank you, Susan. I have so much fun with you guys and your comments, too. And of course, uh, my friend Karen, it's always nice to see her. Same here. And Amy, do you want to mention your website where they could find out more about you and look up the books you've written? Well, thank you so much. It's uh, and I'll type it in here. It's just amyalessio.com. Uh, uh, for a long time, I wrote a series about a woman who worked in an antique mall, and uh, it comes with vintage recipes. I need to finish. I'm starting a new series uh, in the spring about uh, someone in Galena, uh, and it's got paranormal. Yes, you can go to my site and look that up. Thank you, Amy, and thank you, everyone. The recording should be up within about a week, and then look for those recipes. Definitely. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Good night.